Uh, well, th thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm amazed that I find myself at a psychoactive mushroom conference. Uh, there are, apparently are many of us uh, interested in this topic, so I am going to try to introduce you to some of my uh, research, and I look forward to any uh, comments you might have at the end, and look forward to meeting you afterwards. Uh, but otherwise, let's get started. So, uh, you see, as you see here, there's a uh, drawing from a, a, a codex of, uh, from the colonial period when the Spaniards first started uh, uh, to uh, conquest Mexico. They were documenting uh, the indigenous traditions that they uh, found there. And uh, one of them here, you can see a, a man eating mushrooms, and from behind him is sort of this monstrous uh, deity touching him in the head. Uh, it might be Zoshapili, uh, one of the gods they had there that was particularly associated with uh, psychoactive substances, of which there were many, but today we're going to try and focus on uh, mushrooms. So uh, what, what brought me to this conference? Uh, I usually speak at conferences and I'm the, the weirdo, the, the, the person uh, that, that's uh, doing something a little different, but here it's, it's nice to find myself among uh, kindred spirits. Uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist, which means I study, uh, anthropologists study anything that human beings do uh, from ancient times to modern times. We study uh, phys physiology, uh, language, but I'm, I'm particularly focused on culture, which we define as shared and learned behaviors and beliefs. And so that can really be a, a wide topic. And I particularly um, am interested in the study of ritual alterations of consciousness, uh, which is also a broad topic. So as Dan, uh, in introducing me, I, I did uh, finally uh, get out of being a, a PhD student. I finally finished the PhD, uh, which focused on ayahuasca, uh, particularly the Santo Daime religion from Brazil and its global expansion. Uh, I did a uh, doctoral, uh, doctoral thesis on that and then did some postdoc work here uh, that I just completed at the University of Toronto uh, that focused on Santo Daime in North America. Um, so although I, th I think some speakers might touch on ayahuasca later today, I, I won't go too deeply into it because I'm going to try and uh, focus on the mushroom uh, aspects of my research. Uh, but just to give you a little background, uh, if you haven't, ayahuasca is a uh, powerful, uh, potent, psychoactive beverage uh, that originated in the Amazon rainforests uh, of Peru and Brazil. Uh, there are many different types of ayahuasca ritual, uh, the original being uh, indigenous shamanism uh, in the context of indigenous shamanism in the Amazon. Uh, my research uh, on ayahuasca focused on the uh, Santo Daime church, which it kind of, I, I describe it as, it's like going to a Catholic mass, but instead of the, the bread, they give you a uh, glass of uh, ayahuasca, which they call daimi. Santo daimi means holy give me in Portuguese. Uh, and so they very much view the, uh, in, in Santo daimi, they tend to view the glass of daimi, the sacrament, as very much like the bread in a Catholic or Christian mass, as, as the, the blood of Christ. And uh, here you see some members of Santo daimi uh, who are all wearing white uniforms called fardas. Uh, and so as a cultural anthropologist, uh, I, do, I did a, over a year of ethnographic field work, uh, which is a fancy term for just hanging out uh, with people. Uh, and, and really, I, so I, I lived, I, I'm not a member of the religion, but I, I lived and, and went to many of these rituals uh, with uh, European members of Santo Daime uh, to try and understand why people are going to these rituals. Uh, Europe especially is supposed to be a place that's secularizing, becoming less religious, and yet you have the expansion of the Santo Daime Church. Here you see the, the females on one side, males on the other. It's ge a gender-divided space. Uh, people, this is during a dancing work, so for uh, six to 12 hours, they will be standing and dancing uh, back and forth, almost like a mandala, uh, and drinking daimi uh, through the whole ritual. Um, and so just to give you an idea, it, Santo Daime has expanded across 12 European countries. Uh, they, uh, as you can see there, anywhere with that double-armed cross, which is a symbol of Santo Daime, uh, has a, a, an active Santo Daime church in it. The, the countries with boxes around them have members of the religion that don't necessarily practice there, uh, but will go to usually the, the largest churches in Amsterdam. And uh, it's, the Netherlands is, was the first place where this, uh, this religious practice was uh, legalized. It's otherwise very illegal in most places in Europe, although it's be, become uh, it's it's the, in the process of be, becoming legalized in Italy and Spain also. And so that was my doctoral work. My, my uh, 
postdoctoral work here at U of T in the Department of the Study of Religion uh, focused on the Santo Domingo Church in North America. There are churches uh, in three provinces, British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec, and then also in 10 states in the United States. Uh, so it's expanding quite rapidly. It's not giant numbers. There's only 700 uh, Dimista or Fardados is the name of Santo Domingo members. There's 700 of them in Europe and, are, and a roughly a equivalent number in North America. So just you, you can search on the internet and uh, learn more about that if you're interested. Uh, so to try and shift this more to the, the mushroom aspects, when I was doing my field work in Europe, I asked my informants to, um, to try and understand um, how, how they think about uh, their ayahuasca or daimi sacrament. And so um, I have a background in cognitive archaeology, cognitive anthropology, so I did sort of an, uh, an, uh, an exercise in cognitive anthropology called uh, cultural domain analysis. Uh, which is just a, another fancy way of saying I went and asked 32 members of Santo Dami in Belgium, I asked them, uh, can you name all the sacred plants that you know? And they each give me a list. And then I have a computer program called Anthropac that allows me to put those lists in uh, and it'll spit out a, um, a new list that, that sort of uh, correlates all of the individual lists and gives me an idea of how uh, sacred plants are thought about, the, the, the shared thought patterns about that, that cultural domain of sacred plants. And not surprisingly, ayahuasca was the most salient or the most important in the minds of my informants, uh, followed by cannabis, which is a very well-known uh, psychoactive plant. But third was, was mushrooms. And I, I found this interesting that they think of mushrooms, over half of them mentioned mushrooms in their, in their lists, their free lists, and they they consider it a sacred plant even though it's not a piece of, it's not vegetation it's a it's a fungus but they still categorized it along with ayahuasca cannabis peyote san pedro and iboga because they they consider these all to be part of a, a, a category of psychoactive substances that are used within a ritual context for um, as a psychoactive sacrament or sometimes even a, they view them as plant medicines so another word for this this group of uh, sacred plants, uh, you may have heard of it, called entheogens. It's a uh, term to try and capture uh, when these substances are not used sort of in a recreational or even uh, purely medicinal way, but as a, uh, in shamanistic or mystical religious practices, uh, entheogen uh, comes from the Greek for revealing the divine within. So you see some of the um, psilocybin mushrooms on the left, the amanita mushroom on the bottom left, we will uh, discuss at the end of this talk. The peyote and San Pedro cactus uh, both contain mescaline and are used in uh, Central and South American and then uh, indigenous traditions, also the Native American Church of North America. The top right, you have ayahuasca, the two plants that go into ayahuasca uh, that, um, that together uh, allow, I won't get into it all, but the, allow the uh, psychoactive effects to be felt uh, within the, the person who drinks it. And then in the middle there, there'll be a talk, I think, later on iboga, which is an African entheogen. Okay, so how did I, I really didn't mean to get into this as a topic of study. I, I sort of stumbled into it. That, that's common, I think, for researchers across the board, that we, we, we don't know what we're going to find until we start looking. So I, I began as an archaeologist studying uh, indigenous cultures of Mesoamerica, uh, prehistoric uh, bef uh, cultures that uh, people that lived in Central America before Europeans arrived. You can see there's multiple regions of Mesoamerica. Uh, and I particularly focused on, on the eastern region uh, of the Maya. You might have heard of the ancient Maya, uh, one of the most advanced civilizations of, pre of the pre-Columbian Americas. Uh, and I, through studying the Maya and just trying to understand their worldview, their ideology, their ontology, their, their, their sense of um, their, their ideas about the nature of existence, I I, it did, that path just led me to uh, their uh, use of uh, or their use of psychoactive mushrooms in their rituals. So it began. I, I was really what I was interested in is why do these uh, the ancient Maya people? When I look at their sculptures and their art, they they emphasize and seem to be preoccupied with um, ritual specialists uh, making contact with spirits and beings in a in a sort of supernatural other world. So not this world, where the, which is peopled with f 
physical beings. But as you can see here in these two lintels, uh, which are stone uh, carvings, a uh, member of the royal court has put down an, um, some, an offering that is being burned. And the, out, of the, out of the smoke, which they depict as a, a vision serpent, uh, as, it, as, it, um, as it spirals up into the air, they, they've depicted here out of the mouth or the maw of this vision serpent has come an ancestor of this, this noble. And she, so she's speaking with someone who's dead, uh, someone who's, who died a long time ago, but, but is, is communicating and, and from their perspective, uh, receiving guidance and information from this other world. Uh, and so I was just intrigued by this. It's so different than the world I grew up in. Uh, when I, I was raised, I'm not Catholic anymore, but I was raised Catholic. And, this idea of speaking to the dead was not something I learned about in church, or uh, it's not something we come across very often. So I was really interested in why um, they, they, they uh, were, were, I was interested in why they were interested in trying to contact this other world. Uh, and so in order to try and look at um, this idea of portals that open up a doorway between this world and, and some sort of other world or other worlds, uh, one of the, the main artifacts we find are these iron ore mosaic mirrors. And if you look on the top left, it's kind of like an ancient iPad. Uh, and in that it's, fit, and it's fitted together with these polished pieces of, of iron ore that are very shiny and reflective and uh, put together and fit so tightly. It's really a masterpiece of, of lithic uh, technology in the ancient world. Uh, and trying to understand, OK, why, why do we find these, these artifacts over and over again in elite burial sites? And so I, I ended up. Uh, I've co-edited a book that just came out with the University of Colorado Press, uh, Manufactured Light there. Uh, I co-edited it with a Mexican colleague, Emiliano Gallega. And in that, I, I wrote a chapter, and that's what I'll address today. Uh, if you want to get more insight on this, it's online. It's, uh, you just look up my name, and uh, Techniques of Luminosity is the name of the chapter, and that's really what I'll be presenting uh, today. Okay, so. We're really lucky uh, as archaeologists studying ancient Mesoamericas. Uh, we have a very rich corpus, uh, a very rich collection of material artifacts. Because the ancient Maya, the ancient Mesoamericans were so advanced, uh, they've left us with, uh, for instance, these are, these are rollouts or um, images that are painted polychrome ceramics that we find in archaeological contexts. We have the many colors, and they're painted scenes uh, we have thousands of these, and, and on some of these uh, ceramics, we find images of uh, nobles or kingly uh, personages interacting with non-human, sometimes animals, sometimes a mix of animals. So on the top left, you have a, a noble uh, sort of talking or in, in conversation with a, uh, a rabbit jaguar, which doesn't really exist in this world. But you can see a speech scroll being emitted from the mouth of that rabid jaguar over and across a, uh, a mirror, one of these iron ore mirrors in profile. On the bottom, you have a similar scene with a mirror in profile with a water bird on the other side. And so I was just really trying to understand, similar to those, those vision, vision serpents, what is this? Why, did, they just, did these ancient Maya just have a very overactive imagination that they, they just thought they, they, were, they were thinking about uh, talking to some sort of imaginary uh, monster or um, otherworldly being. I, I thought that this can't be, that didn't make sense to me. So I started uh, trying to look at what other possibilities there might be to explain uh, what we're seeing here. Uh, in another, this is another polychrome ceramic. And in other, other scenes where mirrors appear, uh, we also get these little mini people. So that this, this mirror, you can see there's being held by a, what's usually referred to by Maya scholars as a dwarf. Okay, and that dwarf is, is holding this mirror in front of uh, a noble uh, person, noble man, uh, and he's looking into it. And I'm trying to understand what, why are we seeing what we're seeing here. Uh, here's a, a detail of it. You can also see that as the dwarf is holding that mirror up, uh, we see another dwarf behind him drinking out of a, a vessel. We, that's a problem with archaeology is we can't really, uh, we don't know what he's drinking. But it's just interesting that these, these two things, I started to think, oh, there's, they're ingesting something and, the, and they're juxtaposed in this way. There must be something important to that. We also find, very rarely, but we sometimes find in, in good context, these wooden, wooden sculptures of, of, of that dwarf uh, character. And one of the things, we don't find any skeletons of dwarves. Archaeologists usually assume these were real 
people with, uh, w that, were, that ge had a genetic uh, uh, disorder that where they would be um, very small, but we don't find any of these, uh, the skeletons or bones of these dwarf characters. And so especially when we're finding a, a wooden, it's most likely that this, this, uh, this little person holding a, a mirror there was one of these wood sculptures here, which archeologists um, interpret the, uh, the facial expression as in a trance state. Okay, and so that's when I started to, to look and inquire into and, and consider that we do also have species of, from the genus Psilocybe uh, in, the, in Central America, and especially in the rainforest regions, but across the region. Uh, there's two examples here, Psilocybe mexicana and Psilocybe cubensis. Uh, and we also find in archeological context these stone sculptures uh, called mushroom stones. And so here's one from Guatemala, and they, they really date across the, the spectrum from the uh, early hundreds, like 100, 200 AD, uh, all the way into the, the early classic period in the 700s, 800s AD. Uh, and so underneath these mushroom stones, there's always a little, little person or a little animal uh, underneath the cap of the mushroom forming the, st the, the stipe or the stalk there. Okay, so that's archaeology, and we're very limited in archaeology because we're having to make a lot of interpretations from uh, sort of the, the uh, residues of, of culture, the garbage that's left over, uh, and it's very hard. Cognitive archaeology is very limited. We, we really can only look to art. We, have, we can also read Maya hieroglyphs, but it's still, there's a lot of guesswork left. So I, I started looking at ethnohistory, and these are written records made by uh, the Spanish... Uh, conquistadors and, and uh, colonial, uh, the, the colonial officials that came over to, uh, to uh, invade and take over Mesoamerica in the 15th and 16th centuries. One of, one of them, uh, Friar Sahagun, who was a priest, was very interested in, he, his goal was to try and convert the natives. Uh, but, and while he was doing this, he, in order to convert the natives, he, understood, he, he knew he had to try and understand the, their worldview uh, in the first place, so he'd know how to how to speak to them, and so when he when he spoke to his um, indigenous informants, uh, he would drop many pictures and write down uh, what he heard, and he and he lived. He was kind of like a proto anthropologist in a way, other than his his intentions were very different. Uh, so here's a picture of a of what he called what his his informants called an imp or a, a little being that's that's drawn on top of the mushrooms, and you can see it's sort of anthropomorphic, but also has a beak and is is. Uh, also zoomorphic, or like an, has animal characteristics. Uh, so Sahagun was working with Aztecs in the western part of Mesoamerica. Uh, you saw that opening slide was, was, uh, uh, was from, his, from those early drawings and was, um, th had the Aztec word Teonanacatl, which means flesh of the gods. Uh, but it, the modern, modern Maya also have an idea of little people of the forest uh, called Alush. Uh, and so this is really a, a common theme uh, that we find across the region. Uh, here's, a, here's a description from Sahagun in his uh, a mushroom party that he called that he attended with the indigenous uh, practitioners he was working with. And here's a quote from him: "The first thing eaten at this gathering were certain black little mushrooms, which they call teonanacatl, which inebriate and cause hallucinations and even excite lust." These they ate before dawn, and they also drank cacao before dawn. The mushrooms they ate with honey, and when they began to get heated from them, they began to dance, and sing, uh, some sang and some wept, for now they were drunk with the mushrooms. And some cared not to sing, but would sit down in their rooms and stayed there pensive-like. Then when the drunkenness of the mushroom had passed, they spoke one with another about the visions that they had seen. So in one way, he is giving us an accurate portrayal, but another thing you can see, it's filtered through uh, uh, from a, an onlooker who has not had the mushrooms themselves and is really, the only way that he knows how to describe it is they're inebriated, they're drunk. Uh, you can only really compare it to alcohol. So there's still sort of an interpretive gap that uh, we're now trying to close today. And then we can go all the way into the modern period uh, when in the mid 20th century uh, a guy who started as a banker but ended up becoming kind of the first professional ethnomycologist, uh, R. Gordon Wasson, he uh, went journeying through Mesoamerica and found himself in Oaxaca, and he met a woman named Marina, Maria Sabina, who's now very famous in uh, the psychedelic subculture as a mushroom shamaness. Um, lived a very long life, 
And so he um, talked with her and she agreed to uh, sort of initiate him into the mushroom ceremonies that she performed in the state of Oaxaca. Uh, she, was a, of, she was part of a, an ethnicity known as Mazatec, uh, which is sort of in between in this, this, the center. Oaxaca's in between the Aztecs in the west and the Maya in the east. And so he went to some of these, uh, they were always held at nighttime, and he, he went to some of these ceremonies and was just blown away and, uh, at what he experienced. He wrote a, an article in Life magazine about his experiences with Maria Sabina, and that article in a lot of ways can be traced back to sort of the, that, that he got linked in with people like Timothy Leary, and we see this is sort of the, the seeds, the beginning of the psychedelic 60s uh, can be traced back to these, these, the meeting between these two. So... Uh, what I'm really interested here, this, this is sort of a, uh, I know I'm the first talk, so I know there's a lot of interesting talks coming afterwards that are going to get uh, deep into the healing potentials of substances like psilocybin mushrooms, uh, the entheogens uh, in general. Uh, so Maria Sabina was an indigenous mushroom healer. And rather than uh, Sah Sahagun's uh, 16th century uh, account, where he's describing this as a drunkenness. Uh, they're drunk and they look like they're crazy and he wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, Wasson documented uh, interviews with Maria Sabina and so did, um, this is from a book by a, a Mexican scholar named Estrada. Uh, if you want to learn more about Maria Sabina, his book, Maria Sabina, Her Life and Chance. There's also a, do a documentary I found on YouTube the other day all about Maria Sabina that will give you an idea of the chance that she would sing through the, her rituals. But here's how she describes how the mushrooms heal. P patients would come to her and she would do these ceremonies with her, which are, it's something that we as in the West have trouble with. We usually separate spirituality and science. That isn't how uh, indigenous people in the New World did it. They, they saw these, thing, these worlds of, of health and well-being, and then spirituality, they saw them as very much complementary, and so their, their approach was much more integrated than ours. I think uh, this is something we can learn from. So here's the quote from Maria Sabina. The sickness comes out if the sick vomit. They vomit the sickness. They vomit because the mushrooms want them to. If the sick don't vomit, I vomit. I vomit for them. And in that way, the malady is expelled. The mushrooms have power because they are the flesh of God. And those that believe are healed. Those that do not believe are not healed. So the, the vomiting, uh, I don't know if people here, I assume some people here have experience with psilocybin mushrooms. I don't know if you've had nausea is a, a symptom. Uh, you might want to not stop yourself from vomiting if, in terms of as, as far as Maria Sabina is concerned. And then this vomiting by proxy is something I've come across with informants in, with ayahuasca also. Sometimes people, uh, my informants, uh, the centodyme members known as dimistas, they will describe that vo vomiting or purging as a way of expelling uh, the sort of um, uh, toxins and um, either physical um, ailments and sicknesses or psychological hang-ups and neuroses. It's a way of expelling these from the body, getting rid of them, moving past them, and that sometimes people resist the vomiting and they claim that sometimes there's this vomiting by proxy, that if someone's holding on to these things then someone else can expel it for them and it, and it leaves. So it's, these, these concepts, this way of thinking is very foreign to uh, at least my university training, uh, but uh, something to keep our minds open about. Okay, so bring this back to the archaeological evidence, we noticed that Wasson uh, observed that um, uh, across linguistic lines throughout the Mesoamerican region, the sacred mushrooms are called little children, uh, niños in Spanish, then uh, by names that are always affectionate and respectful. Uh, Maria Sabina, the Mazatec shaman who initiated Wasson in his first mushroom ritual, told him that the children are the spirits of the mushroom. He also cites reports from colleagues who attended sessions where little people answered the questions put to them by the shaman. And Maria Sabina claimed that the voices of the little children or the little saint spirits contained in the mushrooms, they, they speak to her when she's under the influence of the mushrooms. Uh, Wasson commonly found that in accounts of the visions that the Mesoamerican uh, indigenous people see after they consume the sacred food, whether seeds or mushroom or plant, there frequently figure hombrecitos, or little men, mujercitas, little women, or duendes, supernatural dwarves. Okay, so now, now this is helping to fill in, for me, some of the archaeological uh, artifacts that we find, that we can't, 
I don't have a vision serpent that I can talk to the dead with, but with the ethno-historical evidence and then with this modern ethnographic evidence from the 20th century, it starts to fill in some of these gaps of trying to understand, okay, so there is a, I, it was helping me understand why I'm finding little people uh, associated with, with these mirrors. Um, and these ethnographic testimonies evoke the ancient evidence. So that's what I just, um, we're calling the Maya mushroom stones. They're 28 to centi 38 centimeters high, so about this much, uh, with a standing man or animal represented, I guess it would be a stand standing woman also, uh, below the cap of the mushroom. So I, I want to bring up uh, some DMT, dimethyltryptamine. Uh, psilocybin is a tryptamine, so it, in the same chem chemical class as psilocybin. Uh, DMT, uh, some interesting research by Rick Strassman. Uh, you've probably heard of the book DMT, The Spirit Molecule. He uh, did serious uh, empirical studies giving uh, DMT to test subjects in a hospital, and then he recorded their experiences. And a common theme through many of the people's uh, encounters with DMT was, uh, was a, an, were encounters with what they would refer to as them, uh, or these these non-human beings that would come and talk to them or interact with them. Sometimes um, Dimistas, my informants, will describe uh, receiving sort of astral surgery, they call it, where um, otherworldly doctors will come in and take parts of their body out and put other things in. V very strange uh, uh, accounts, nevertheless interesting. So, so this idea of them uh, you can see Alex Gray, if you ever want to see beautiful art, if you haven't seen Alex Gray. Alex Gray does a really good job of depicting in visual form in his paintings what, otherwise, what the experience is like to undergo uh, an, an entheogenic uh, session uh, to show it visually what's often these parts that are very difficult to put words on. And so uh, Strassman, I think, does a very good job of, of describing what these experiences are like. And you can see the blue parts that, that this idea of, of uh, interacting with, with them. Objects in our field of vision appear brighter or duller, larger or smaller, and seem to be shifting shape and melting, are softer or louder, harsher or gentler. We hear new rhythms in the wind. Singing or mechanical sounds appear in a previously silent environment. Our emotions overflow or dry up. Anxiety or fear, pleasure or relaxation. All feelings wax and wane, overpoweringly intense or frustratingly absent. At the extremes lie terror or ecstasy, what Aldous Huxley called heaven and hell. Uh, time collapses in the blink of an eye, two hours pass. Or time expands, a minute contains a never-ending march of sensations and ideas. We, we experience others influencing our minds or bodies in ways that are beneficial or frightening. So I think um, we can see a lot of uh, uh, correlations and um, associations between uh, the DMT experience and the psilocybin experience. So I also want to address, I, I know we're probably mostly focused on psilocybin mushrooms at this conference, but I think a really uh, another interesting uh, topic is the, the Amanita muscaria mushroom, uh, which uh, in Siberian context, the, the word shaman comes from uh, an, eth uh, an ethnic group, the Tungus in Eastern Siberia, uh, and it's their word shaman. It means the one who knows. And in uh, Siberian shamanism, there is, uh, Ethnolo ethnolo ethnological, ethnographic evidence uh, showing that they would use Amanita muscaria mushrooms, the red mushroom with white dots on it, uh, and that these are often associated with uh, ideas of um, fly agaric men. Fly agaric is another word for uh, a moniker for Amanita muscaria, and Amanita girls. So these um, Lilliputian hallucinations is the technical term from a secular standpoint, that these people must be, ha it's, it's not real, they're having hallucinations of little beings, little animals, little people. And so um, I, I see links between, even though these are vastly different cultures and it's hard to make you know, direct links between cultures, we all have a similar physiology and so human beings, there's something about human beings when they ingest these things are, are likely to, or are, sometimes will encounter or will see what they, they take to be little people. So what scientists describe as Lilliputian hallucinations uh, are interpreted by non-Western cultures as real encounters with, with actual little people and animals. Um, the conviction that these miniature people and animals are not hallucinations, but rather uh, real uh, manifestations of hidden aspects of reality is a cross-cultural phenomenon associated with mushroom consumption 
Uh, in literature, we find it in China, in Papua New Guinea, even in Britain with uh, some neo-pagan uh, uh, groups that like to uh, indulge with psilocybin mushrooms. And so we're seeing this is a real cult, cross-cultural phenomenon that I, I'm interested in exploring here. Uh, so the Amanita muscaria mushroom, we see a shamanist on the left, a Siberian shamanist. Uh, there's a great uh, chapter in Richard Evans Schulte's book, uh, Plants of the Gods, that, that really dives into this. But this, this, uh, this association of um, uh, Amanita muscaria with little people, we often see it even just, it's, it's bled into the popular culture uh, of Europe. Uh, this is a Hungarian Christmas card or Happy New Year card. You find it in German, English, French. If you go online and Google Images, there's a whole bunch of examples of, of the same uh, idea. And so just in closing, uh, to bring it up to the modern period, while I was over doing field work in uh, Europe, I happened to be in Berlin at the same time as a, uh, a Belgian artist named Karsten, I'm not, I don't know how the umlau goes, Karsten Holler or Karsten Holler. Uh, and he was putting on a show. He's, he's a famous, he has a real uh, emphasis in his work on mushrooms, particularly the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Uh, and so at, at the Berlin Hamburger Bahnhof Museum, he had an exhibition called Soma. And here you see, this is a picture I took when I went there. This is a rain, it, it's an um, eclectic art piece uh, that includes, you can see big sculptures of Amanitas, but also bolites and different styles of mushroom. And then walking around them are real life reindeer. Uh, and so why would someone do this? What, 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 is he, what kind of point is he trying to make? So he's very interested in, in the places where science, scientific methods, and art meet. And what he's trying to do here is he just saw this as a giant scientific experiment. That he was going to test some of the ideas, some of R. Gordon Wasson's ideas, about uh, the cultural history of the Amanita mushroom, Amanita muscaria mushroom. Uh, so he would feed the reindeer these uh, Amanita mushrooms, which kind of harkens back to an idea of Santa being a shaman. And that's why the reindeer fly. And so, why, you know, these are very sp speculative. These are, these are speculative ideas, but he was, he was kind of testing or playing with these ideas. And so he fed the Amanita mushrooms to the reindeer, and they had a belt around them with a jar underneath, and he would capture the urine of the, of the reindeer. Uh, and this was all displayed. The urine was there in refrigerators that were locked, and uh, that was the idea. So, again, what is he doing here with this? So he's he's playing here with the the idea the the there's this is really a a frontier of of the unknown. We we these are, there's still a lot of mystery surrounding the amanita mushroom, uh, but the notion he was playing with is this idea of bioprocessing, and so there are psychoactive effects of the amanita that are known, and they we we know they come from ibotenic acid and muscimol. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also another chemical in Amanita called muscarin. I think this is actually where the muscaria species name comes from. And this causes uncomfortable physiological effects such as excessive perspiration, salivation, blurring of vision, and abdominal, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. There's a great paper on this by my colleague Kevin Feeney. Uh, and so what Feeney's looking at is the same thing um, Wasson was, was uh, trying to understand, which is, is there a way that ancient cultures might have been trying to understand how you can minimize the physiological discomfort and, and optimize and maintain the, the psychological effects? So citing Wasson and his famous book, which is very speculative and, and uh, was criticized by a lot of his colleagues, uh, the Soma, the Divine Mushroom of Immortality, uh, Wasson uh, turns to the Rig Veda, which is a sacred text of Hinduism, uh, to, uh, to try and understand how bioprocessing might have been done in the ancient world. Um, were, was this famous sacrament in Hinduism, Soma, which is much debated? Was it marijuana? Was it Amanita? Was it uh, uh, some sort of DMT-containing plant? We don't know. Uh, but from this, this sort of theorizing, uh, looking at the Rig Veda, it, it's possible Soma seemed to have been dried. Uh, it also seems to have been put through a sieve or like filtered. Uh, was what these techniques to try and bioprocess the, the, the muscarin out of. Uh, one of the more interesting that, that this is, brings it back to Karsten Holler's art is, this, is the idea of bioprocessing, bioprocessing the artifacts through urine. Uh, and so uh, there's, these, there's a, a couple um, phrases from the uh, Rig Veda. Again, it's, it's very speculative, 
but nonetheless very interesting what, what this artist is trying to do here. So he fed the Amanitas to the reindeer. The, it's all displayed. This is all part of this big, bigger sculpture throughout the whole gallery. Uh, you can see Amanitas in the fridge, and then the urine, the uh, reindeer urine stored in jars. The interesting thing that Holler is trying to do is up through the middle, you see this walkway, and it goes up some stairs. Up in the top there is a hotel suite. And Holler opened, opened up to the public, if you pay 1,000 euros, you can have this hotel suite for the night, and we will unlock the refrigerators, and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, right? And so there's a great Guardian article on it, on some of the people. Most people did not drink the urine. I, I didn't come across any stories of it, but I, I remember asking the people who run the gallery, like, I've got, well, I'll, I'll get to it in a second. Um, so anyway, that's, that was his idea. He, he, he does have some tongue-in-cheek humor, I think, in it as well, but um, he did not experiment with the urine himself, but he did eat the amanitas with no bioprocessing, just eating the, the mushroom and uh, multiple times, and here's how he describes it. He says, they're very unpleasant, and you throw up. The, the first four times I tried it, I became comatose. Then you wake up, throw up, and you don't know where you are or how long you've been asleep. The sixth time, I started to chant like a Tibetan monk. Okay. So I would, as an anthropologist, I'm just, we're, we're at this time, right, where our culture is trying to make sense of these substances that are obviously, we're having a psychedelic renaissance right now. And I think we're trying to do it in a different way than it was done in the 1960s, trying to do it carefully and, and slowly and properly so that we don't run into the problems we had in the 1960s. Uh, but I'm interested in how this Karsten Holler is able to have a legal and promoted art event in Berlin, uh, while at the same time, if people want to use these in Europe or North America for religious purposes or for therapeutic purposes, you'll be put in jail. So that's why it's a disclaimer for all of you who might have ideas after this talk. I'm not trying to promote this, and I hope other speakers speak to this. These things can be dangerous, uh, can be very dangerous when used outside of a responsible, controlled context. I'm interested that Holler is able to have this art exhibit and feed people Amanita urine, while at the same time my informants, my Dimista informants, my colleagues, really my friends who, uh, who are in the Santa Dime Church, they were, uh, in the early 2000s, they had the police come in the middle of a ritual, after the, the middle of the, they're all on ayahuasca, and they came in with machine guns, started yelling at them and get on the ground and arrested them all. That's a very different approach, both in Germany, right? Uh, while I was over there in 2010, 2011, a man in Switzerland was arrested for uh, opening and running a, a psilocybin mushroom church. He was actually kicked out of Switzerland. Um, very different than art is allowed, but this man opening a church not allowed. Uh, interesting questions for the freedom of religion, uh, freedom of thought. Uh, so, yeah, Western society's approach to psilocybin and all entheogens is in flux right now. It's a very exciting time, but a very sort of fragile, vulnerable time. I think we have to be very careful and not getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, but there's very interesting research, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, at uh, UCLA, Johns Hopkins, and NYU, showing that psilocybin has, has these, when used in a controlled clinical context, has wondrous uh, benefits for, for health especially with people that are trying to deal with end-of-life anxiety when they're on their deathbed, also uh, with addiction. They've had great results with helping people get off of a tobacco addiction. And uh, like my colleague Anderson Todd here, uh, who's here today and he'll speak later, uh, I'm, under, under, I'm undergoing training right now to become a registered psychotherapist. There's a program at Wilfrid Laurier University in spiritual care and psychotherapy. And I think it's a, this is a new specialty in Ontario. Uh, Ontario's being very progressive with this. Registered psychotherapists don't just work with entheogens, they work with all sorts of psychotherapy. But I think this is especially good if anybody's thinking of going into psychedelic psychotherapy. This, this RP designation is kind of like an RN or a registered nurse. Uh, I think would be a great training and certification for sitters or people that are going to be guides as psychedelic psychotherapy opens up. We, you, it's definitely good to have someone who's trained and knows what they're doing to help guide someone through the experience. Uh, the Dimistas have this in the Santa Dime Church. They have guardians that are there to help people when they're undergoing a difficult uh, process or difficult phase of, their, of the ritual. So just some quick lessons for psychedelic psychotherapy. I think anthropology can be a great benefit uh, for, for us as a culture trying to, to grapple with this very new uh, form of, of psychotherapy. 
We have to remember that entheogens or psychedelics, whatever you want to call them, uh, are very different than conventional Western medicines. I was having a conversation with someone earlier today. It's not just like taking a pill and it does all the work for you. As you might have seen or as you might have experienced, uh, these things, when, they're, when not used by people who know what they're doing, can really uh, be, well, it's uncertain. Uh, it, it, can, it can be dangerous. And so I think uh, anthropology it can play a key role in helping to look at non-Western cultures that, that too often we view as primitive uh, when it comes to entheogens, they're actually much more advanced than us, and we're actually primitive. And so I think anthropology can help bring in and translate some of the wisdom from these very uh, foreign, different cultures to help inform the way we integrate these substances into our own uh, medical system. Okay, so, and just rather than dismissing visions that people have as hallucinations, they may be. I, I'm agnostic about it. I don't know whether there's beings in another world or not. I don't know whether it's a hallucination or if people are really meeting other beings. But I think we have to be sensitive to it certainly feels like it when people are undergoing this experience. At, at that moment, it feels like they're talking to their dead grandmother or it feels like they're talking to a little dwarf being or, or a cosmic elf or whatever they're talking to. And I think if we try to not just discount this as a hallucination but try to use that and, and integrate that into, into the, the, the entire experience of, of undergoing an theogenic session, um, I think we can actually use it as, as an aspect of, of therapy. Uh, for instance, I think we could maybe understand it in terms, if we don't want to believe that it's a real elf being, uh, we can look to Jungian psychotherapy, the idea of archetypes, and, and that maybe this is a manifestation of the uh, collective unconscious, and, and try to understand it that way. I, I think the more we remain open to these, thing, these other ideas, I think we'll have more opportunities to, um, uh, to benefit. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for your time. I look forward to speaking to you after. We got time? Uh, yeah. Do you want to like, maybe like two questions? Well, we got time for a couple questions, I think, till 12.55. Does anybody have a burning question? Uh, yes, in the back. and you were talking about the, um, what's happening in the body. Can you comment on the similarities between glutamate GABA as well as the ibotenic acid muscimol? Uh, probably not. Uh, uh, I think uh, that's a very kind of biochemistry question. I avoided biochemistry through my education as much as I could. I, I, I take, I'm much more after all of those processes have happened, I'm much more dealing with the human being and the social impacts after that. Uh, but if someone is a biochemist and knows about that, maybe they, could, they can go back there and help answer that question. Um, sorry about that. Does anybody, uh, yes? Um, so, just to geek out a little bit, going back to the point that you made about cross-cultural um, similarities in hallucinations, um, the little people. I'm just curious to know what you think, um, sort of chicken of the air question, you know, do the hallucinogenics cause or to influence this cultural development um, or give this collective consciousness of little people like, you know, all cultures have these creatures that live in the dark, for example, with very similar. Yeah. Um, so were those things first? I don't know. It, it, is, it is difficult. I mean, um, one idea is to look, I, I, I'm kind of fond of Terence McKenna's stoned ape hypothesis, which, and he argues that human consciousness first came about when the first kind of Homo erectus or Neanderthal picked up some psilocybin mushrooms and went, whoa, and like had this, ex <laughs> this expanded consciousness. I mean, it's, again, in this world, it's unfortunate that we deal with a lot of speculation, but these things really bring us to the brink of our knowledge. And I mean, hundreds and thousands more dissertations can be written on, on these subjects. As far as I do know, there's a great book, I'll press if you're interested in ayahuasca, uh, the, the Bible of ayahuasca is a book called Antipodes of the Mind. Uh, it's, the, it's a phenomenology of the ayahuasca experience by a guy named, a uh, cognitive psychologist named Benny Shannon. And he really argues people from native, indigenous Amazonian cultures, Judaism, Christianity, from all different backgrounds, 
all seem to see similar images on ayahuasca. So this is getting into it. This is getting below culture, getting to a deeper place uh, where all human beings we share a physiology, uh, and we all evolved as a, as a species together. So it, it is interesting that um, I, I don't know how to answer it, but he he really does a very good job of of describing how vision serpents are very common. Um, so I won't go on. But Jeremy Narby. Right. Narby, Narby talks, yeah, that the same serpent shows up again and again. So again, we're babies with this, right? We, we're at the University of Toronto. This is like our Harvard in Canada. We're, we're all very smart here, but, but the more we look at this topic, the more, the more humbled I get and the more humbled we should get about, like, we are, we are primitives with this, and we're just taking our baby steps now. Maybe we were in the 60s and we fell and we learned our lesson from that hard fall. And now I think we're getting up and maybe being a little more careful as we walk forward, but we have nowhere, nowhere to go but, but progress. And so uh, I invite you all to study more, and I'm sure by the time I'm an old man, we'll have figured out a lot more. Um, so anyway, I, I think I'm past my time. Uh, thank you all again, and have a great day.